Welcome to Spice Talk. Today's topic is AI democratization. I'm delighted to speak with Dakshi Agarwal, who is the IBM Fellow, CTO at IBM AI. Dakshi, welcome. Thanks for having me. So before we dive into our discussion today, please share your story and how you got into artificial intelligence. Well, uh, I joined IBM Research right after my college, and uh, I had time to work with some of the best minds. And in 2012, I started working very closely with clients on big data, uh, some telco companies, and uh, pretty soon there was uh, AI wave, and I found myself very deeply engaged with client work and AI that they were implementing in their solutions. So, so that's you how are, I think you are a visionary, right? You figured it out that back then. Well, I, you know, I just happened to be, I think, you know, in the right place with the right time. Awesome. Yeah. So I remember the first time when I tried to solve an ATM issue, I had to speak up, uh, speak with a chatbot. The experience at the time was not seamless, but today I may not even notice when, you know, speaking with a customer service bot. What was your memory or first memory of experiencing AI, not necessarily at work, but in your uh, personal life? Well, uh, uh, I still remember, you know, when I first came to US and went to a grocery store, the door automatically opened for me. And that, for me, that was AI. Back, back at home, uh, that point, uh, you know, fancy shops will have someone open doors for you. And here it was, it was opening automatically. So to me, that was my first experience. Yeah. With that's an interesting story that I can relate to as well, right? Uh, but you know, IBM's Global AI Adoption Index revealed that a third of those surveyed will be investing in AI skills and solutions over the next 12 months. And more expensive use of AI democratizes AI, right? Providing access to insights to more people, technologists or non-technologists alike. So on a scale one to 10, in your opinion, how are enterprise business embracing AI? Is anyone out there doing it right um, with AI these days? Yeah, I, I would say based on the same uh, survey, Global AI Adoption Index, I would put it somewhere between seven and eight uh, mm -hmm. out of 10. Um, it depends on the geography, it varies, but roughly I would say four to five, um, 40% to 50% of mm -hmm. the enterprises are have already adopted AI mm -hmm. and the rest are considering seriously adopting uh, AI, experimenting with it, uh, doing some POCs, essentially exploring the use of AI. Mm -hmm. And uh, you asked about uh, who is doing AI right? Um, I, I would give one example, just very recently mm -hmm. CVS Health uh, uh, when they needed to roll out their vaccination campaign, they used uh, Watson Assistant. Mm -hmm. It was rolled out in flat four weeks. Uh, CVS Health was uh, anticipating a tenfold increase in their call volume as people had questions about their tests, uh, uh, their vaccinations, and you know uh, all, all sorts of uh, uh, questions as these vaccination programs rolled out. Mm -hmm. uh, CVS Health used uh, Watson Assistant uh, coupled with the speech to text mm -hmm. to answer some of the simpler questions yeah. uh, uh, through AI, leaving more complex questions for um, for the experts. Mm -hmm. You know, I personally experienced that, by the way, through the vaccination process, very, very impressed with that process, how seamless it was. As a matter of fact, I did not know it was through a bot, chat bot until after the fact, right? Because I watched the the Think, IBM Think event, I listened to the um, keynote that I learned and realized that was through a Watson bot. I said, wow, that was really impressive. Yeah. So uh, in hundreds of conversations I've had with enterprise leaders over the years about AI, one common failure I see or I heard is lack of understanding of what the right problem to solve. Right. Or sometimes not knowing what use cases they should start with that would yield high return from AI. What do you think are the top obstacles or opportunities for AI adoption? Yeah, absolutely. I think you hit nail uh, on its head. 
uh, it's all about ROI. Uh, the days days when AI was just out there as a curiosity or for experimentation, they are over. Uh, there are well-established use cases with demonstrated uh, ROI in so many industries. Those will be the places uh, that you would want to start with. Of course, the uh, obstacles are uh, unrealistic expectations. Sometimes AI just seems uh, magic, uh, or not develop, not investing sufficiently in developing skills, or uh, or getting a services partner. So. Um, those will be some of the challenges. I still very vividly recall. Mm-hmm. Um, I was working with a with a telecom company. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had support from the top. Mm-hmm. Uh, nonetheless, uh, initially the progress was slow. Mm-hmm. Uh, but once uh, we got to a use case, working with a line of business uh, that could demonstrate clear ROI, the road was mm-hmm. pretty simple. Mm-hmm. Uh, not simple, but you know. Uh, with far less obstacle and with far more resources, um, uh, we could be successful uh, once the right use case was hit. Totally, right? Once the right uh, use cases, but also measurable ROI is presented, and then you can drive alignment much easier uh, through internal alignment and communication. Absolutely, absolutely. And then once, you know, uh, you see one use case being successful Mm -hmm. in an enterprise, then it generates further ideas yep. that risk uh, risk reduces essentially. Absolutely, so, absolutely. Yes. Well, imagine if you were in a store, right? You ask someone if they sold products, the question is too vague to really expect a meaningful answer. But if you ask them where the bananas are, I'm sure you get a very clear answer quickly, right? So that's both are valid questions, but one is more focused. This is why defining a problem is so critical. That's why we know data is so critical to AI and machine learning, because we've all heard the phrase garbage in, garbage out, right? Our solution to harness the power of the data, regardless where it resides, is data fabric, right? Now, Forrester actually first coined that term in 2013. Now, IBM talks quite a bit about data fabric do you think data fabric is a clearly understood term or business are still trying to demystify the data fabric? Yeah, I don't think it's a still a well understood term. To me, data fabric stands for a data management architecture that goes mm-hmm. all the way from data discovery to consumption of data for mm-hmm. AI and analytics. Um, in the whole, this whole end-to-end process, uh, Data Fabric provides you with the right governance so that you can trust that data uh, in your AI and analytics. Mm-hmm. Um, I think there is a still some confusion because sometimes Data Fabric tends to get confused with just data virtualization, sometimes with database federation, but it's really about this whole end-to-end process going all the way from data discovery to consumption of data. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, that's really good. Uh, good point there, right? If you imagine again, business teams, right, do not have to know how to code or be schooled in the intricacy of AI backend, right? Instead, they will use AI like you and I use mobile phone today. For example, we're you know in the grocery store shopping, trying to figure out what grocery we're gonna buy. We can look up for a recipe, right? Dinner recipe first, and then decide what we're gonna buy. Or we're running late for a meeting, we can text each other to say, hey, wait for me for another five minutes. Or our GPS, you wanna go somewhere, you drive the car, you hit mobile and, and type in the location, you can you know, get direction right away. What is IBM doing these days to create these AI accessibility to non-technical people? You know, could you share could you share a real life example with the audience? Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, what I what IBM is doing based on tens of thousands of AI engagements that we have done, we see some use cases with proven ROI and end to end value. And for these applications, for these areas, we are rolling out solutions that provide AI in such a way that non-technical users can readily consume uh, AI. I'll give you some examples. For example, KPMG uses uh, IBM Watson to provide, um, to analyze uh, various reports, uh, text documents, so that they are 
professionals who mm -hmm. are not coders, who are text analysts, can more easily, more readily figure out, more accurately figure out mm. text treatment of uh, various projects. So that's a case where a non-professional user uh, is using uh, Watson mm -hmm. uh, to get their day-to-day -day, uh, tasks easier. Mm -hmm. uh, I have other examples uh, in, uh, in all sorts of industries from uh, planning in finance, uh, all the way to HR uh, and uh, buildings management, uh, property management, mm -hmm. where IBM has these end-to-end -end AI applications. That's amazing, right? It all actually comes back to connecting data with business drivers and the data fabric helps accomplish that, right? It is what I call point-to-point -point thinking, knowing the business imperatives, business drivers, the different levels of raw data, who is consuming that data, who will have access to the data and why the data is important in decision-making. And then the big payoff was, was AI, how it will elevate the experience. In the end, it's all about how do we improve, elevate the customer experience, workforce experience, supply chain experience, or strategic, you know, strategic partner experiences, right? So let's get real here. Is AI an essential or nice to have for enterprise businesses? Or when do you see AI being a part of business at its full adoption? What does that really look like? Can you share a real life example uh, for, on that? Yeah, I would say that uh, give it uh, four to five years mm -hmm. and you would see AI adoption full throttle even in the industries that uh, haven't adopted AI um, that much so far. Of course, you know, AI adoption got really accelerated in last uh, two years due mm -hmm. to pandemic. And if I look at, let's say some of the top industries, retail, banking, telcos, uh, industrial and manufacturing in each of these industries, uh, especially retail, banking, telco, uh, so many processes today are enabled uh, by AI. Mm -hmm. uh, take a case uh, from uh, manufacturing, um, Ford and IBM just recently announced uh, uh, using AI to mm -hmm. detect uh, defects or other issues that might be in vehicles that are being produced uh, mm -hmm. while they are still on the line and uh, take any corrective actions. So, so, so that's an example uh, mm -hmm. of AI getting deep into processes. Uh, next generation of uh, mainframe is going to have uh, built-in AI mm -hmm. to detect fraud in uh, mm -hmm. real time. So now I'm talking about really uh, most critical processes in industries that are beginning to have AI. It's not just uh, customer facing uh, mm -hmm. processes. Mm -hmm. Uh, so these were some of the verticals, then of course, horizontals, customer care, HR, finance, legal, marketing, sales. Uh, I think that all of these uh, processes are going to get transformed um, by AI. That's incredible, right? I, as I think about some of the technology, how it can really do what we call technology for good, right? I, I, work, I was talking to another larger uh, player out there, technology company, they talk about how they leverage AI to augment people with disabilities, right? So that, you know, the workers would have the manufacturing, uh, they could work for manufacturing companies uh, with the augmented cognitive skills so that they can really help solve the shortage of labor shortage for manufacturers. So as I think about all these use cases, it's fascinating to see how far along we have. So in, as you said, in the next four to five years, it'll be a lot more uh, progression there. The Tim O'Reilly right, popularized the open source software and Web 2.0, and he said, we are entering a new world in which data may be more important than software. So what's next? Yeah, I think uh, it's the quantum bit. Quantum bit is next. Uh, when we were in colleges, we all studied bits. I think uh, four years, five years down the road, all college students will be reading about quantum bits. I think that's the next big thing, quantum computing. Yeah, I hope there's less Shakespeare reading more quantum bit right in the college. I wish that too. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> but thank you so much for sharing your insights right with us today, Dakshi. And uh, here's my takeaway from our conversation today in a very short uh, time, we won't be talking about AI adoption as people see it as part of doing business or part of making life more efficient. And uh, AI then will shift to being part of an enterprise business strategy, right? Delivering value for non-technical people, working in many different areas, such as customer experience, brand differentiation, human resources, research and development, management and sales, right? This is where the democr uh, I would say AI democratization looks like at crossroad of technology and hu humanity, it will improve business outcomes and lead to sustainable and repeatable growth. Absolutely, you summarized it really well. Yeah. Uh, thanks for having me on the program. It's such a pleasure having you. Thank you for joining us, everyone. This is the fourth episode of CXO Spice Talk with IBM. So check out the other three episodes we had on data fabric, data privacy, and trustworthy AI. So wish everyone a happy holiday season. Stay hungry, stay bold, and stay grateful.